like I should like start all these episodes looking surprised, like you just showed up, like like Mr. Rogers. Did, although now I'm dating myself. Does anyone even know Mr. Rogers? Okay, good, good, good. I thought I'd be like, you know. Anyway, he'd always come home and he'd be like surprised to see you were there, and he put the sweater on. And anyway, welcome to Healthcare Triage Live. Um, we are late, 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 late. Not my fault. Um, so we're just gonna jump right in. For, oh, by the way, it seems that all the questions people put in the comments last week somehow miraculously disappeared. I don't know why, neither does anybody else. We're not ignoring you. Please just put the question back. If you have a question and I didn't answer it, put it back. We will re-add it to the list. I don't know. We lost it. Sorry. Anyway, the infant formula milk industry. Oh, the milk industrial complex. The milk industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. You can't turn on the TV with at least watching an advertisement hailing the mental and physical benefits of X baby formula. Since then, there's a prevailing belief the parents must purchase this or that brand of baby formula or their child will be at a disadvantage. You're a pediatrician. Yes, I am. You would honestly like to hear my opinion on these alleged medical claims. Okay, first of all, you know, first of all, you could breastfeed and not have to do the formula thing at all. So feel free. Um, secondly, formula is like, you know, only up until one year. So at that point, you're, you're turning to milk anyway. When you're in the formula, it's like, you know, the vast majority of formulas are just fine. They're, they're just fine. They're normal formulas. It's like once you reach sort of the basic components, they're all the same. Now you can, if you go, there's a million on the shelf because there'll be the soy based one. There'll be the like, you know, super fat one. There'll be the, uh, low iron one, there will be the one that's like more easily digestible, there'll be the hypoallergenic one. The vast, vast, vast majority of children need the basic formula. Um, and then everything above that is sort of like uh, bonus or whatever, useless I could say, and for many, many people useless. Now the idea that now we need the like super formula because that's gonna lead to a better brain, no, no. That's like something in a lab or cooked up, there's no no randomized controlled trials or any trials that show like kids that get this or that formula are smarter, do better, develop better, and, you know, physically better, mentally, none, none, none. That's all like maybe, it's like it's almost a supplement industry. Um, it is just not based on actual research. So um, my kids were breastfed and when Amy was done with that, uh, they were formula fed and it was the basic whatever uh, formula was available. I can't even remember which com company it was because I didn't care. Um, and for the most, 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 most people, neither should you. You just shouldn't. Next question from AK11234. The Food and Drug Administration said there are serious and sometimes disabling side effects from the commonly used class of antibiotic called fluoroquinolones. Is this just another FDA overreaction or do the risks outweigh the benefits? Is this an, okay, well now I'm questioning, like is this a new thing? Because I mean, fluoroquinolones for all for a while, like you know, they were sort of, we don't like to give them to young kids. They can stain the teeth. They can have some other issues. Um, we use them very commonly. I have not heard of any new serious or disabling side effect. If it is a new thing, I don't know about it yet, which disturbs me um, because I should. Now, to be honest with you, I rarely prescribe fluoroquinolones. I'm a primary care pediatrician. Almost all the prescriptions that I get for antibiotics are amoxicillin, once in a while augmentin. I really just don't get that deep into the weeds about resistance because I just don't see it. So it is possible that something new has come down the, uh, the path about fluoroquinolones and I don't know about it, but I'm gonna look into it because you've, you've made me nervous. Until that moment, if there isn't anything new, then there weren't any like crazy disabling side effects that I've known in the past that would have prevented us from using them unless it was some kind of like drug-drug interaction, which is, well, of course would be a concern. Bottom line, I gotta look into this for you. Disprog, folate during pregnancies causes autism. Are we being trolled? Oh, you're not being trolled, but here's where we went off the rails on this one. All right, first of all, this was not a published peer-reviewed study. Even though it was covered more than almost any other news story in the last two weeks that I know of in health and kids, except for the swaddling thing. Um, this was a presentation of an abstract at a meeting, which means that truly all I know about it is like this much, because that's all that you can see. Um, there is no peer reviewed publication. There's no vetted science. I don't know what the results were. I just, it was a presentation at a meeting that a limited number of people heard. And yet it was covered as if it was like the leading story in science or nature or the New England Journal of Medicine or John. It's not the case. In fact, one of the good studies that's been done on what, what, what should we think about abstracts was done by me. Um, we, when I was a fellow, 
back in the long ago, this is probably like 2001-ish or 2002-ish, um, I had what a randomized controlled trial rejected from our pediatric meeting. And it irked me so badly, because so much crap is often presented at those meetings, that we did a study to see what happens to abstracts that are presented at meeting. And the first thing we found is that this meeting that I went to, something like 87% of abstracts that are submitted are accepted for presentation. So own up right before, right off the bat. The litmus test for getting your stuff presented at a meeting, I'm sorry, the, lit, the bar for getting your stuff presented at a meeting is low. The vast majority of stuff submitted was accepted. So being presented at a meeting does not mean it's truth. The second thing is only less than, or about half of stuff presented at the meeting ever made it into the peer reviewed literature. So half the stuff presented at, presented at meetings never gets published, which means it didn't pan out. So it's like, you can't trust that stuff. And even then we did studies looking at whether poster presentation or platform presentation or poster symposia or, or had any bearing on the quality of the journal, how fast it gets published, all those other things. And the answer is no. Being presented at a meeting is not necessarily linked to later being published or to being right. The, the peer review process is much less um, rigorous because of course they only have a tiny abstract as compared to the same thing. It is not the same and yet the, the press often covers it like it is the same thing, which is why I as a policy will never speak about any of my presentations at meetings before they are published. And so when a meeting says, we'd like to add your paper or your, I'm sorry, your abstract to the list of things we're going to publicize about the meetings, I say no. I'm not alone in that, although I would say most people probably take the press, but I am very concerned about the fact that stuff that's presented at meetings is not of the same rigor as stuff that is actually published in the peer review literature. And so that's what that folate study was. Now that folate study was not the first study that looks at folate. Other studies have found that folate is protective in association against autism. Other studies don't find the same finding. So it could be that it's an outlier. It could be that it's not as rigid. It could be that there's a mistake. I don't know any of that. I don't know until it actually gets published. Um, we do know that folate is really good for other things, um, like presenting neural tube defects, which is why we take we give it to pregnant women. So. Um, there's lots of proven benefits. I don't know about this. This has not been published yet. It probably shouldn't have been covered to the extent it was, but the, the health media can't help themselves. They just can't. And uh, neither can people for, you know, being hungry for that kind of stuff. So yeah, I won't even cover it in healthcare triage news. This is the thing is like people have said, well, you cover this. And my answer is no, there's no study. I can't even comment. I don't know about it yet. So um, we have to wait until unfortunately it gets published. But I, I would tell you until that moment, no one should get panicked really. Jenna Van Sickle asks, is there a difference in regulation between herbal supplements and vitamin supplements? No, no, there's not. I take magnesium oxide, which comes from behind the pharmacy counter to prevent migraines. Yeah, no, no difference in regulation. Supplements or supplements or supplements. You have no idea if you're getting what you think. And there's so many healthcare triage episodes on that. I'm gonna send you to those. Olives Olive says, why don't we use male birth control? I've read some articles about the RISUG, which is the reversible inhibition of sperm under guidance, and I don't get why it wouldn't be viable. It seems a lot less harmful than the pill. Well, we don't, I, it, it's not that this stuff can't get studied, it's that we don't really have them available. You know, people would, I think a lot of people would argue that male birth control is like condoms. If you're talking about taking a pill, they just haven't really been studied. Um, why? I don't know. Probably the patriarchy. I don't, I don't know. Probably because we, we've always, it's, it's the girl's responsibility not to. I mean, I'm being facetious, but that I, I got to imagine that's what it is. And that somehow we as a society, or they're the world of the term, that's the girl's responsibility or the female's responsibility. And they have to be responsible for it and they have to take care of it. And men don't do it. So there is no pill for that. Maybe we could make one. But again, it would have to be not just decent, it would have to be all the way. Like to prevent to prevent a woman from getting pregnant, you need to just prevent that one ovulation a month. To prevent a man from getting, you have to kill all the sperm. They all got to die. Every single one. Because if a sum get through, you can get pregnant. And you need it to be like, oh, so it would have to be something which could reversibly inhibit sperm. And, and that's what you're saying. I don't know that they've achieved that yet. Um, and so therefore we don't have it. Why don't we put more money into looking into that? Excellent question. Talk to the NIH. Dark Diva 92, or the, you know, for that matter, the pharmaceutical companies too. I shouldn't just blame the government. 
Dark Diva 92, ICG Food Intelligence, and Leaky Gut. What's, um, hmm. if you look up online about digestive and health issues, you can find a lot on leaky gut, which is intestinal permeability. Apparently, this causes a host of health issues. There are also companies that claim ICG Food Intolerance testing via a small print prick let you know if you have an intolerance to certain foods. I'm going to call, mm, on this. Um, leaky gut syndrome is an actual thing. It's not that common. Um, it's not nearly as common as you think it is. Uh, and the idea that it's only about certain foods, I don't actually believe that's the case. Uh, the idea that you can pinprick test yourself for certain foods to tell you if that's going to give you GI issues, you're sort of going off the reservation there. Um, you're just not really focused uh, because that's not well proven. Um, plus, it's like, would, you, would it be classes of foods or individual foods? This just isn't as researched as I would like it to be in order for me to actually talk about it and say something really authoritatively one way or the other. I just don't think it's, it's there. So I would be suspicious of companies that are trying to get you to eat their food because they're making these claims. Connor Mortlock, is there a way to lessen, into lessen tolerance to dexamphetamines? I've pres prescribed them for the last seven years. You're 19 now. I'm assuming this is for something like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, to lessen tolerance, I, I don't know of any. Um, on the other hand, if you've been taking it for seven years, tolerance would happen long before then. Um, it wouldn't take like seven years to get there. This is something you should probably talk to your doctor about, uh, about whether you need to continue to take them, about whether there are alternatives, or about whether you need increased doses, exactly what's going on, whether therapy might help at this point. Um, I would talk definitely talk to your doctor. Liz Barino says, hello, what diseases often produce false positive tests? That's a really great question. Diseases don't produce false positive tests. Tests produce false positive tests. The tests that are the diseases that are most likely to have false positive tests, for the most part, are really rare diseases. Because if a disease is really rare, then a positive test is more likely to be not real, because the disease is so rare, than that, unless it's a really, really, really perfect test. Um, the other would be if a test is just bad, and if it's not, um, I gotta get this right in my head. No, oh, I'm not gonna be able to do it. I can't remember if it's sensitivity or specificity off the top of my head. But if it doesn't have the right test characteristics, it might also produce too many false positive tests. But that is test dependent. Those are test characteristics, not disease characteristics. So first, know that that's a test, not a disease. But if you really want, to, if you're really getting at the, if you really push me, yeah, a disease that's incredibly rare is much, so like. You know, even when we used to do well, problems, we still do HIV tests. It's rare enough that when they do the first test, a lot of the positives on the first test are still more likely to be false positive and negatives than, than true positives. That's why they do the second test, because one is more sensitive, one is more specific. And the one that is, that is one way to begin with lets in more false positives. And that's why we need to rule them out with the second test. But that's not because of HIV. That's because of the tests. All right, we have time for maybe one more. Kenji Wardenclyffe, what causes visual snow and why do some people see it all the time, like TV static noise, overall visual input? Is there reason to be concerned about it? I don't know what causes it. I mean, it's got to be something either in the retina or in your nerves um, or in your eye. I mean, in like the vitreous humor or whatnot. Um, if you're seeing a lot of it, I'd certainly talk to your ophthalmologist. I don't think it's always a sign of concern. But if you're seeing a lot of it, it can be sometimes an aura for migraines. It can sometimes be... Uh, you know, I think you're tired. It can also, I think, rarely be a, you know, a harbinger of problems. But regardless, it is definitely something worth talking to your eye doctor about so that they can do a full test. And then if you're fine, it's probably something just to monitor. And I'm going to stop there because we are actually over time. We will add the questions that are left to next week's, uh, next week's Healthcare Triage Live. Um, check us out on patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Any support is appreciated. Check out the episodes. We are finishing up opioids. Opioid month ends next week with treatment of opioids abuse. We're, I'm so proud of how those episodes have turned out. You should really go watch them. Facebook.com slash healthcare triage. HTMerch.com. Watch news on Friday. Watch everything that has to do with healthcare triage. Thanks always for your watch. Thanks as always for watching. We appreciate your support. We'll see you next week.